Coming up on DTNS, will Microsoft buy Discord, the coming wave of government cryptocurrency? And Peter Wells tells us when searching online is good for your mental health. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. And as I just mentioned, freelance journalist Peter Wells is back with us. Welcome back, Peter. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much uh, for getting up early for us again uh, and bringing us your story to talk about. It's awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It was a, a fun one to write. We uh, were just chatting uh, with Peter and Amos and Roger about uh, windowing of movies and the fact that Black Widow is going to come to Disney Plus in July and what that means. If you want that wider conversation, get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Microsoft released critical updates to fix four vulnerabilities in Microsoft Exchange servers on March 2nd. Despite Microsoft urging immediate attention to these zero-day vulnerabilities, F-Secure reports that only about half of those visible Exchange servers on the internet have been patched, and criminals are attacking tens of thousands of them per day. The UK's National Cybersecurity Centre recommends those who cannot patch right now should block untrusted connections to port 442 and require access through VPN. Microsoft has an automatic mitigation tool for unpatched servers available in Defender Antivirus. Facebook announced it will hold a one-day virtual version of its developers conference on June 2nd. It'll be called F8 Refresh. Just keep mashing that F8 key. Isn't F5? Anyway, VP of Platform Partnerships, Konstantinos Papamilitiadis, will deliver the opening presentation. Uh, so no keynote from CEO Mark Zuckerberg is planned. Niantic announced Monday it's partnering with Nintendo to develop a new title based on the company's Pikmin franchise. The app will be developed in Niantic's Tokyo office and will launch later this year, including AR gameplay activities to encourage walking and make walking more delightful. Oh, finally, someone disrupted yeah. walking. Yeah. Yeah. Just get out uh, and walk. It's great. China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, the State Administration for Market Regulation, and a few other agencies have jointly issued new rules defining what personal information is considered necessary for mobile apps and therefore can be required from users in order for an app to function. Necessary data includes things like your address for a delivery service. They can make you give that because how are you going to get your delivery otherwise? Or a phone number and location for ride hailing. Uh, gaming and education apps may only require a phone number, which is used as verification of identity in China. And some apps like news or your browser or your weather uh, may not require any information in order to work. The new rules go into effect in China May 1st. Amazon announced a new Montreal-based game studio Tuesday with plans to create original AAA games with an initial focus on a new online multiplayer title. This is Amazon's fourth studio and run by Ubisoft's Tom Clancy Rainbow Six Siege team. Hmm. All right, let's talk about the OnePlus phone. OnePlus announced the 6.55 inch OnePlus 9. There's also a bigger 6.7 inch OnePlus 9 Pro and a more budget oriented 6.55 inch OnePlus 9 R. The 9 Pro and the 9 run on the Qualcomm Snapdragon 888, and the 9R runs on the 870. All three models have in screen fingerprint readers and a base level 128 gigabytes of storage. The main differentiation in this round of OnePlus phones are the Hasselblad cameras. The Pro has a 48 megapixel Sony IMX789 main sensor, an ultra wide 50 megapixel Sony sensor, and a 3.3x telephoto camera. There's also a fourth monochrome camera that helps improve black and white shots. The 9 is almost the same as the Pro, uh, it just doesn't have the telephoto lens, but it does have the monochrome one. Both models get Hasselblad Pro mode with Pro control over fine tuning, so you can adjust ISO, focus, exposure time, white balance, and more. Uh, you can also shoot in 12-bit RAW. Most of the time, if you do RAW on a phone, it's 10-bit. The 9R, if you're interested in the budget model, is only coming to Asian markets. So it's selling for 39,999 rupees in India, for instance. That's about 550 bucks. The OnePlus 9 uh, starts at $729 US, and the Pro at $1,069. Pre-orders start March 26th, shipping April 2nd. Uh, OnePlus also announced its watch, the OnePlus watch, uh, has a round screen, 46 millimeters. You can get in silver or black. 
one to two weeks on a charge, depending on how heavy you use it, IP68 water resistance. It connects through Wi-Fi or paired to your phone, no cellular connection, although it can store up to 500 songs, so you can be listening to music while you run without having to carry your phone. It can monitor sleep, stress, blood oxygen saturation, and heart rate, runs on its own operating system, just like a Fitbit, and pairs with an Android app with an iOS app promised to come sometime in the future. It can also work as a remote if you happen to have a OnePlus TV and can even sense when you've fallen asleep because it's got sleep tracking and then turn off your OnePlus TV. <laughs> uh, available April 14th for $159. So uh, OnePlus getting expensive, still uh, a lower price for a flagship phone, uh, but this is not the you know super mid-range priced OnePlus anymore, and they have a nice round watch too. Well, and I think that the camera stuff is 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 part of the reason that they can, well, perhaps char charge what they're charging, and 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 people will buy it. This is a very impressive spec, uh, especially just for the Pro model. This is, I I mean, we're getting to the point where now, sure, there are other phones that. Um, put a lot of emphasis on on the camera, but this is, this is a very very nice device. Yeah, I, I the the one thing I would uh, caution on is the use of the word Hasselblad. There, um, they, they've licensed their name in a couple of different mobile phones over the years, and it's never really improved the the picture quality. I, I feel that they're a little bit loosey goosey when it comes to giving their name away to to sell uh, phones. But um, yeah, it, I mean. On paper, everything looks amazing here. Yeah, I, I, and OnePlus, I, what I what will add to, to all of this is OnePlus is now, I think, a player in the flagship market right alongside Samsung, uh, you know, Google, Apple, et, et cetera. I, I think these these phones are good enough. Like I said, they're, they're still relatively uh, affordable. $729 for OnePlus 9 is not bad, but that's not far off what you'd pay for the equivalent Galaxy phone or, or even an iPhone. The OnePlus watch, I mean, I'm not in the market for a watch uh, right now, but it is it is right, again, in that perfect price point mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it's not cheap, but it's not crazy expensive. And it seems to do all the things that, for example, my Fitbit Versa 2 does. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the uptick will be um, on a proprietary OS. All right, VentureBeat sources say that Discord has signed an exclusive acquisition discussion with an unnamed company, and Bloomberg sources say that that company is Microsoft. Supposedly, the talks value Discord at around $10 billion. Bloomberg reports that no deal is imminent, with one source saying that Discord is still more likely to go public than be acquired at all. Yeah, uh, my my rational read of this is Discord wants to go public, uh, but to dot their I's and cross their T's, they want a really good valuation, and so uh, they're they're going through due diligence of like, okay, if we were to get acquired, who would buy us, and how much would they pay, uh, and and if that turns out to be a better deal than going public, you know, we we intend to follow through on that, but let's let's go through that entire process to find out. My guess is they will still end up staying independent and going public. Yeah, but who else would buy them? I mean, I think maybe Amazon, uh, if they bought them and rolled them into Twitch, could be a good um, solution. But I do think that Microsoft is a good kind of parent company for for uh, Discord. They, they've tended to be very hands off in their acquisitions recently. So GitHub, they've they've left the community to itself and. Um, yeah, so at, uh, th this was one of those stories where at first I was like, oh, they don't like the sound of that. But then I thought, well, you know, this is a new Microsoft. I, w I, w I don't necessarily, I, w I wouldn't be too worried about this. Yeah, Microsoft seemed like uh, one, one, I'd never really thought about who's going to buy Discord until, you know, 24 hours ago. But once I thought about it, I was like, yeah, Microsoft makes sense. But there's Microsoft Teams. So mm. sure, those two, those two could could work in tandem. They're not exactly the same platform, but there's some crossover that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Amazon is another company. I mean, Google, like it, it the list is quite short for who would mm -hmm. actually buy Discord if it were to come to that. Yeah, Apple's got and the I money, think, but they wouldn't do it. Google's nah. got the money, could buy it for Stadia, maybe. Facebook has the money, I don't think they want to get into buying anything right now with all of the antitrust investigation. So that really does leave Amazon, 
uh, and and Microsoft. And Microsoft would buy it to put into the Xbox. This is not going yeah, into totally, you know totally. productivity. This this is this is going in with Minecraft and Xbox and game studios and all that. I'm guessing. And and no one uses Teams as a social platform. There's you know I, I'm on a couple of different uh, Discords and Slacks that are community run. Um, I've never seen anyone say, "Hey, join me on my community Teams." Like that. So so that that product is so different to Discord that I I think that uh, yeah. there, there is room for Microsoft to have both. And. Uh, you know, I see people in our chat uh, throwing shade on Skype, and and deservedly so. <laughs> but uh, uh, but they've also done a really good job with things like LinkedIn and Minecraft. Uh, and so I I would I would guess out of all the companies we've talked about who could afford a ten billion dollar valued valued company, uh, Microsoft might be one of the better stewards there. I I wouldn't I wouldn't be uh, shattered if that happened. I'm still hoping and I'm guessing that Discord just wants to stay independent, at least for now. We shall see. Bloomberg sources previously said a new switch was coming this holiday season that would have a 7-inch 720p OLED screen and output at 4K. Now we know a little more about how that output would work. A new report from a Bloomberg source says Nintendo will use an NVIDIA GPU that features DLSS, Deep Learning Super Sampling. Uh, that you may recognize from NVIDIA's RTX 20 series GPUs. DLSS is great at upscaling, uh, though it can also output 4K native as well. Games have to have code that supports DLSS in order for it to work, so it probably would only work on newer games. It has to have some code in there, but when it does... Roger Chang, our producer, was pointing out uh, in our pre-show today, like, sometimes it looks better than native 4K. Like, it, it really does work well. The new Switch would also include, uh, according to Bloomberg Source, an upgraded CPU and some more RAM. You gave me a heart attack there, Tom. I'm so excited for a new Switch, a new 4K Switch. And at the start of that uh, story, I thought you were going to say that it's not coming at the end of the year. Um, I'm I'm really excited because I've I've only got a Switch Lite, and I I miss being able to plug it into the TV and and play it with my kids. So yeah, bring on bring on that 4K uh, Switch. I want to play me some 4K Zelda. Link in 4K, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I I I think this is. This is, I mean, obviously this is still leaks. This is rumors. Uh, it's not even rumors, it's leaks. Uh, but but it's from re reliable sources. So it does feel like we're definitely going to get a new Nintendo model. It's going to be capable of 4K. I think it's fascinating to see the NVIDIA GPU talk mm. in here because that, that's that got everybody guessing like, okay, is this going to be an RTX 20? It makes sense that it would be DLSS because then you can get a more power efficient GPU in there that doesn't have to do full load 4K, but it can do the up sampling. That way, Nintendo can keep you know battery life and power consumption yeah, yeah. and cost of, of goods down. Yeah, and then the original Switch, you know, shipped with off-the-shelf uh, NVIDIA products uh, in it. So again, that all makes sense that Nintendo aren't the kind of company, or at least. Modern Nintendo don't seem to be the com company that uh, wants to reinvent the wheel every time, and that's one of the ways it keeps the the cost of its hardware down over years. Is um, it really has uh, embraced that idea of just buying what's off the shelf um, to to keep those prices down? It's going to have a cute name too. It's not going to be the Switch 4K. It's going to be like the the Switch Ultra or Pro. Switch. <laughs> Everyone says Pro these days. Yeah. The Switch, Switch Plus. No, Nintendo yeah. never goes with the expected, though. So I don't know. I don't know. Send us <laughs> your ideas. Switch cute. Switch cute. <laughs> Switch super cute. Uh, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Well, Peter Wells, we're so ha happy to have you on the show today, uh, especially because you just wrote a column for the Sydney Mor Morning Herald called How Searching for Help Online Can Be Healthy. And I think we all agree that the last year has affected us all, sometimes not in the greatest of ways. Mental health is a mm. big concern. So if you want to help yourself, do you search online? Well, aren't you supposed to talk to a doctor? Isn't it kind of dangerous to self-diagnose? But Peter, you found some recommendations that searching for help with mental help online isn't always a bad idea. And uh, you just have to go in certain directions, huh? 
Yeah, yeah, it's really important to kind of evaluate the sources. Uh, like anything on the internet, if you're, th there's going to be fantastic uh, advice out there, and there's also going to be really, really terrible advice. So uh, the the trick is to figure out how to to tell those two bits of advice apart. Um, I I was reluctant to kind of name any sources as being, look, you can trust everything that these people say because I'm not a, a doctor myself. So um, I, I felt very uncomfortable uh, offering that advice. But the I guess the, the rule of thumb that I found uh, in the last week looking at this stuff is uh, just, just ignore the stuff that says that, hey, we're going to cure you of your anxiety or your depression by the time you get to the end of this uh, YouTube clip or whatever it is. Anything that says that uh, it's going to be an easy fix, I think, starts to feel a little bit kind of self-help guru-y and, um, and not so valuable. But uh, I, I found that there were some really, really great sources. And, and to be honest, this, this all did come about because Google did an update to their search product where um, if you do a search on depression in both uh, the United States and in Australia, you will be presented with this nine question uh, uh, qu uh, questionnaire, which is used to screen uh, potential patients at psychology departments around the world to see kind of where you fit on the uh, depression and anxiety scale. And so it's a really useful thing that Google are throwing in there to, to say, okay, these are the symptoms you've put in. Here's where we think, like, here is where we think where, whether you need to speak to someone else. And, and I think that's the key thing is the speaking to someone else has to be the next step. You don't want to spend, um, weeks, months on end, just uh, Googling symptoms and thinking, oh, I've got that. Oh, I've got that as well. Because actually I spoke to some uh, therapists uh, as, as I was writing this story and they said that in first year, every psychologist, um, you know, gets to the end of first year and thinks that they have every disorder that they studied that year because <laughs> um, you can see yourself in anything really. But sure. so, so, so there is definitely a danger in, in spending too much time kind of researching, but I think the the nice thing about uh, some of these tools out there is there is still that stigma. There is still that anxiety about going to see seek mental health help. Um, and so at least in when you when you're looking on your phone or listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube video, you're doing that privately. No one else has to know. And and if that's the first steps that you take uh, to to get some help, then then that's fantastic. Yeah, I think one of the things that I thought was interesting is, like you said, uh, you, even with physical ailments, you know, you've got a sore arm, you start searching sore arm, and then the next thing you're you're certain you have some wild, uh, rare disease that you'd never heard mm. of before because you're searching. Uh, but with mental health issues, particularly, taking the step to even search or to talk to someone is important in itself. Like that is that is helpful in itself to to kind of getting you out of the issue and starting to deal with whatever your issue is and it helps you to, to feel less stigmatized like like oh maybe i shouldn't complain or maybe i don't mm. have a problem yeah totally totally and uh, the 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 other thing i found really interesting was um i jumped into so many uh groups on facebook to see what kind of advice was out there and it's not going to surprise you to hear that uh you you get a really mixed bag of advice on on facebook um and so you know i i I've, said in the article something like, uh, in the same way I wouldn't necessarily trust uh, vaccination information I find on a Facebook group, I wouldn't also necessarily uh, trust any of the recommendations I would see in some of these self, uh, self-help kind of, or uh, support groups that I found on Facebook. But the very nature of just jump, joining into one of those those groups and seeing that you're not alone in any of the anxiety or depression that you might be feeling, because this has been a really trying year as as you said sarah that you know that this it's not surprising if you're doing it tough at the moment and there is absolutely no shame in in looking at that admitting that and and seeking uh help and yeah uh whatever you can do to to take, take that next step i think uh is probably um a very very positive thing yeah. I know one thing that I always do for myself, just because we do so much news gathering, specifically tech news gathering, you know, for the show and, and some of the other podcasts that we all participate in and produce. But it's I, I try to think of it the same way. You know, it's like my shoulder hurts. Ah, my shoulder still hurts. Hmm, I'm a little worried about my shoulder. Well, let me go online and see if I can get, you know, some help from an expert. Well, 
does the shoulder expert who's telling me what I should do have credentials? Do they work mm, for a publication mm. that I like and trust? You know, is there a history of of information in the past that that has been helpful? It's like it's all kind of the same thing. And it's mm. easy to say, oh, we'll just do it that way. But I think for a lot of folks, it's 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 uh, it is an ongoing process. Totally, totally. And, um, you know, the the final thing I would say is just uh, psychology and uh, therapists can seem very, very expensive, but uh, I didn't include this in the story because it had to be for print, so it had to be shortened. Uh, but you uh, go to uh, uh, psychology in your state and do a Google search there. You'll find there, there are always kind of free clinics or free support out there. And um, quite often universities will have uh, low cost uh people that you can see as well. So yeah, explore what is out there in the physical world as well as online, but uh, online is a great place to start. The Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and the Massachusetts of Institute, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology will publish their research on prototypes for a digital dollar platform coming up in this July. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has said such a project could help Americans who don't have access to the banking system. This is a way to make digital payments work for the unbanked. Several banks, however, are lobbying against this effort, uh, while companies like Visa and MasterCard want to make sure any new currency works on their networks. They're fine with it as long as they get a cut. And lawmakers, the U.S. Treasury, and the Fed have not approved any rollout for digital currency or determined how it would exist with the global payments network, so any implementation would be years away. Uh, but multiple countries are investigating similar systems. The Bahamas launched its sand dollar last year. That's an actual cryptocurrency. Uh, Brazil's digital real is expected to start circulating in 2022. Sweden is piloting an e-krona. China is piloting its digital yuan. These efforts take advantage of cryptocurrencies, uh, technology, things like Bitcoin, uh, in not needing a complex behind the scenes transaction that you currently need for digital banking. That includes things like instant settlement. Right now, if you transfer between your banks, you know it really takes three days. They have, they have ways of faking it, but it, the actual transaction takes three days. Uh, this would speed that up. There would be fewer opportunities for fraud because there would be fewer chains in the system and public ledgers like blockchains are, are hard uh, to alter. But it would not have the uncertainties of cryptocurrency's value because it'd be backed by a government just like paper money. The MIT Boston Fed project will include at least two prototypes that show how to move, store, and settle transactions. And when they release them in July, everyone will be able to look and see and build on that code. It's just meant to show what's possible. It's not trying to do a recommendation of policy. I, I welcome the e-dollar, <laughs> whatever mm -hmm. we end up calling it in the future. You know, it, it, as far as folks who are unbanked and need more options, it just makes sense. It just makes sense to me. And the whole sort of like, yeah, you got to wait three days. That's how banking works. And the fact that some banks are pushing back on the idea of this because, of course, uh, is is <laughs> not surprising. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's the the... This is where we are going in the future. Some countries mm -hmm. are farther ahead of it than others, but this is this is what's happening, everybody. Get on board. Yeah, it felt like this this was always the end game for the Bitcoin idea because it does, you know, the the idea of Bitcoin of like why why does it make sense that we value things based on gold in a in a vault is is on paper something that does make a lot of sense, but um Bitcoin always felt like something that was uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I've been proven wrong for the last decade, but it felt like <laughs> a, a flash in the pan. And um, I really wish when I was listening to Buzz Out Loud back in the day, I should have bought some of that Bitcoin that you guys kept talking about. But, oh, uh, well, here we are today. <laughs> Uh, research scientist Janelle Shane used OpenAI's language generator, GPT-3, to generate pickup lines, yes, that kind of pickup line, for people looking for love using DaVinci, Ada, and Babbage models. Shane previously created pickup lines by training a neural net on a host of human penned lines that already existed. Of the latest experiment, Shane says, quote, I've resisted trying neural net pickup lines again because more competent means more human-like, which in this case means worse. Or would the neural nets might even copy existing human pickup from internet lists, which would also be terrible. 
human written pickup lines are that bad. But by the way, one of the pickup <laughs> lines poetically read, this was by the Da Vinci model, the AI model was, I will briefly summarize the plot of Back to the Future 2 for you. Ooh. Da Vinci had some of my favorites. Like, you have the most beautiful fangs I've ever seen. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it sounds like it sounds like Shane is negging the AI here. So I think actually Shane is just trying to pick up the AI. Yeah, there's yeah. I mean, it's all okay, a little Pete, bit silly. Pete, tell but... me if this would work. Uh, mm -hmm. Da Vinci sidles up to you at the bar and says, "I once worked with a guy that looked just like you." He was a normal human with a family. Are you a normal <laughs> human with a family? <laughs> well, you struck out there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> How about, do you like dot, dot, dot pancakes? Well, yeah, no, okay, you I, got me there. That, I mean, that might work on me. I'd be like, I was going to say, that was maybe the most effective one. <laughs> yeah, kind of, yeah. Weird. Your are eyes you are mind? like two rainbows and a rainbow of eyes. <laughs> That's I mean, the, curious, thing, I mean the joke here is that, I mean, pickup lines are so silly. Sure, yeah. they're, you know, they very wildly, but the, 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 the AI version, <laughs> someone was like, I want to summarize the plot of Back to the Future. I'd be like, all right, I'm all listening. Right. Try it. Well, let's yeah. see. Let's see yeah. how you go with that. Let's see, yeah. you know, are you good at this? You know, we might, <laughs> might go out for pancakes afterwards. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, let's do it. This one comes from, oh, who does it come from? I forgot. Uh, didn't put that in my notes. Uh, I will check in a second, but, uh, was talking about if we had heard about the PACT Act, P-A-C-T Act, this poorly ac ac acronymed, because there are others, bill is another set of proposed changes to CDC 230 sponsored by the Thune. Uh, by Thune, he's a Republican in South Dakota, and Schatz, a Democrat in Hawaii. Not read the bill, but one that I write up that I saw, by the way, this comes from Mike. Thank you, Mike, for showing yourself uh, in real time in the spreadsheet. Good stuff. Mike says, I haven't read the bill, but one write up that I did see was it was good only if you graded on a curve comparing it to other bills that wanted to gut the law. It requires companies to have acceptable use policies, human manned 800 numbers, a site for tracking disputes, and a whole lot of other administrative burden, as well as requirements to take down court-directed illegal content within 24 hours and 14-day responses to UAP violations. Mike also links us to more about the PACT Act, which we will have in our show notes. Thanks for a uh, heads up on that. I, I know there's a lot of efforts uh, like this out there, uh, but we appreciate Mike uh, putting this on our radar. Indeed we do. Uh, and if you have anything that you'd like to be on our radar, questions, comments, all the good stuff, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. And we thank you in advance. Also shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today they include Brad, Ken Hayes, and Tony Glass. We also got some brand new bosses. Shonda Banak, Sean Sartain, and Christian Sochler all just started backing us on Patreon. So thank you to our new bosses. You're the best. Also, thanks to Peter Wells for being back with us today and telling us a little bit more about what you're up to. Where can people find the rest of your work? Uh, follow me on uh, Twitter, Peter Wells, or check out the help desk uh, in wherever you get your podcasts. It's a daily tech podcast, but uh, it's 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 short and and right to the point. So get on in. Excellent. Hey, patrons, uh, did you know that your ad free RSS feed from Patreon can have just DTNS or just GDI or both? Uh, check your tier on Patreon to see if it says DTNS, GDI, or all in the name of the tier that you're backing us at. Uh, and if you want to change, just change to the tier that has what you want to get in your RSS feed. You don't even need to change your RSS feed. Just change your tier and different stuff will show up at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. We are live on this show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back here tomorrow. Don't miss it. Scott Johnson will be with us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>